everybody and welcome to today's session. My name is Taylor and I'm a Community Engagement Manager here at Apolitical and it is fantastic to have all of you joining us for today's workshop. As you enter, uh, we will be putting you all on mute just to minimise background noise for the time being. And we're going to give it a few minutes before we get started whilst everybody's coming in. Uh, as I mentioned, my name is Taylor and I'm a Community Engagement Manager here at Apolitical and I'm joining from slightly gloomy London. It's starting to definitely move towards winter, um, but it would be fantastic to hear where you're all joining us from. So if you can please just pop in the chat um, where you're joining us from and introduce yourself, that would be fantastic to hear. Um, also, if, if this is your first time attending an apolitical workshop, please do let me know. It's always fantastic to hear about new people joining us. Um, I'm delighted to be part of today's conversation about how to communicate with the public on climate change. And as I said, we are going to get started in a couple of minutes, but I've just got a couple of announcements that I need to make before we can get going. <clears throat> so for those of you who are joining us for the first time, Apolitical is a peer-to-peer -peer learning platform with over 100,000 public servants joining us in 170 different countries. And our mission is to put skills and peer-led intelligence at the forefront of public servants. And we do this through our events, our courses, and our knowledge platform as well. Uh, we will be recording today's session and we'll be hosting it on the Apolitical website via Vimeo. We're doing this so participants and Apolitical members can review the content on demand and further their learning. It will enable us to share the content as well for anyone who can't make today's session. Uh, please be aware that viewers of the recording may be able to see your Zoom username as well as your face and anything that may be within your background. Uh, please let my colleague Vipasha know who is on the call today but you can let her know if you wish to object to being recorded in the manner that I've described. And if you have any further questions, you can find the details of our data protection officer at the bottom of Apolitical's homepage. We also have live transcription on the call today, which you will see on your screens. So if you'd like to turn this on, you can locate the settings at the bottom of your page um, and you can select live transcription and then you can turn it on or off. And today we're fortunate to be joined by two fantastic speakers who I'm very excited to hear from. We have Dr. Michael Shank and Jenna Dutton, who will be leading today's discussion. But before I introduce them, I'm just going to give everybody a couple more minutes to join the room and then we'll start off with a little bit of polling. Um, so fantastic to see so many of you joining us. I can see actually we've got quite a few from the UK, uh, but all over really. So I can see we've got Brighton and Sussex. Um, and then we've also got some joining, oh wow, from, from Washington State in the US. Uh, we can see a couple uh, from Dublin as well. Um, Scotland, so it's fantastic to see. We've got a lot from the UK joining us, which is really great. Okay, yeah, please carry on introducing yourselves in the chat. We are going to get started in just a few minutes. Um, but we're just going to give everybody a quick second to join the call. Um, as I mentioned, if you missed it, my name is Taylor uh, from A Political, and I'm here. I'm going to be moderating today's session. Um, and yeah, we're going to be talking about communicating with the public around climate change. Um, we are going to start off with some polling in just a second, but what would be fantastic to do, and if you can do this would be great, if you can pop your view into gallery mode, turn your cameras on and just give a wave to everybody else that's on the call who's joining from all over the globe, we can see this is really an international audience, so it'd be fantastic if we can get some cameras on and just waving. It's great to see so many people interested in, in how we can really communicate this really uh, incredible subject matter. Okay, I think it looks like we've got quite a few people in the room, so I'm going to get started with some poll questions. Um, so these should pop up in the window if you're using the Zoom app, um, but you may not be able to see them if you're using your browser, so you can just pop your answers in the chat. So the first question we've got is, do you see yourself as a climate communicator in the role that you're in currently? Uh, so we've got yes, no, or unsure. And again, if you can't see the polling on your screen, just feel free to pop your answers in the chat and I can read them out for you. My colleague Papasha has just posted the question in there as well, which you should be able to see. I'm just going to give you all a moment to answer that one um, and then I can read out some results. Okay, we should see the results coming up in just a second. Okay, so yes, uh, is the majority. That's fantastic to see. So 71% of you say that you do feel like you're a climate communicator. 
that's amazing. And then, uh, yeah, we've got 18% for no and 12% for unsure, but it's great to see the majority of you think that you are a climate communicator. And second option, uh, second question we've got, sorry, is does your organization pro provide climate change training? Uh, so yes, no, or unsure. And again, please feel free to pop your answer in the chat if you can't see the window. Okay, and we're just gonna give it another minute or so um, for everybody to answer this question and then we will share the results. Okay, I think we're getting there now. We can share the results in just a second. Oh, wow, so it's a real mixture on this one. Uh, so we can see 39% of people said yes, this one. So the organization does provide training. 34% saying no and 27 who are unsure. So that's a real mixture for that one. <laughs> okay, um, I'm just gonna introduce our speakers and then I'm gonna hand over to them. Um, so first of all, we've got Jenna Dutton, who is a senior planner and social policy at the city of Victoria and a research associate of public policy at the Center for Civilization in the School of Architecture, Planning and Landscape at the University of Calgary. She's worked in collaboration with and for local governments as part of private sector entities for over 10 years and has demonstrated expertise with development and policy planning, strategic planning, project management and public engagement. She contributed to global planning efforts through volunteering for the Commonwealth Women in Planning Network and leading writing and research on various topics, including blowing up silos to fight climate change and feminist planning and urbanism. As a co-leader of the Urban Resilience Dialogues Global Community of Practices, she helps cultivate a community of professionals who experiment with approaches and solutions for adapting our cities to the increasing effects of climate change. And then we also have Dr. Michael Shank, who is a communications director for the Carbon Neutral Cities Alliance, a group of international cities committed to achieving aggressive long-term carbon reduction goals. Michael's professional career includes leading press at the UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network, Climate Nexus, US Congress, Friends Committee on National Legislation, Institute for Economics and Peace, Biodiversity Northwest, and more. Um, and Michael's academic career includes a PhD from George Mason's University of Carter's School of Peace and Conflict Resolution and is focused on climate change. Uh, so we are in very, very capable hands here. Um, I'm actually going to hand over to Jenna first, who's going to get us started, and then we'll be hearing from Michael afterwards. Um, so Jenna, over to you. Great, thank you, Taylor, and uh, good morning, afternoon, or evening, everyone. I'm just going to share my presentation. Okay, can everyone see that okay? Okay. All right, so I can't talk about climate communication without really talking about how I became better at communicating um, about the climate. So in, it's going to do that lovely next slide thing. Okay. <laughs> in September 2019, um, I flew to Copenhagen while understanding the irony of my carbon footprint. Um, and attended a urban resilient summer school um, hosted by the University of Southern Denmark. Um, so it was an amazing experience, an intensive eight days with, as you can see, lots of post-its and poster boards and notes where we designed a um, approach to addressing um, flooding and heat issues for the city of Copenhagen. Um, so we had presentations from experts all over the world, um, and then we presented to the city of Copenhagen at the end of the eight days. Um, and those who presented or presented with me were from 20 different countries from across the world. Um, so I came away from this experience um, definitely energized, though possibly a little tired <laughs> after eight days of this experience, um, but kind of looking forward to relating this experience um, back to my own work in Calgary. So I returned to Calgary where it was minus 20 and snowing um, quite stereotypically. Um, and uh, my workplace had recently uh, put forward mandatory climate change training, like the poll question um, that was just asked. So we sat down and the first question was, what is a word um, that makes you think about climate change? 
and the word cloud, which I'm sure a lot of you um, have experienced in various training sessions, was similar to this, um, but way more negative. Um, there were comments about hoax, boring, um, not interested, and a lot of things that I was really surprised to hear um, from colleagues that I work from every day. Um, but I decided afterwards, though kind of being a little defeated, um, that instead of kind of taking this negative view, I would move forward and see how I could um, relate this information to the work I was doing on a daily basis. So for me, a lot of um, addressing climate communication is thinking about policy alignment. So at the time, um, I was leading a, a community local community policy plan, um, and I wanted to think kind of from a systems perspective and understanding the complexity, um, how could I relate climate change more to the work that I was doing? Um, so for me, it was engaging more with the climate team who, even though they were a great group of people at the city, I wasn't really having daily or weekly conversations with. Um, and an understanding of the importance of working across silos. So a lot of the time coming from a professional planner, um, we have policy documents, but they don't necessarily interact um, with the climate adaptation mitigation documents. And there isn't really an understanding of the connection um, and how implementation and monitoring are occurring. Um, and I think a lot of the time there's a tendency to think that we have to kind of create new approaches um, or, but there's a lot of great resources and tools. Um, so one that recently came available in Canada was the Federation of Canadian Municipalities, the image I have on the slide here, Guide for Municipal Climate Change Staff. Um, so thinking that there's, there's a lot of work that has been done and tools that can help um, your daily practice as well. So I'm a little biased um, because I work for the city of Victoria, um, but we do have a, a great climate leadership plan. And the reason I think it's great um, is because there is that annual reporting back mechanism to members of the public. So they understand what's going on. Um, also, um, the document was created with eClay Canada. And I think um, from my experience with public engagement, um, that's an important one where sometimes engagement led by the city um, and only conducted by the city tends to not have the same um, engagement with stakeholders. Um, and importantly for the engagement, they worked with all of the city departments to develop the adaptation sections. Um, so each department understood um, how their daily work and their work plan connected to this climate forward approach. Um, but importantly, no city or municipality has the perfect climate solution, but the important thing is to kind of move forward with a policy approach. So for me, as I mentioned, systems thinking, I'm a systems thinking nerd. Um, for me, the focus is mostly on these four things. So what is your personal and organizational climate change narrative? Um, so that doesn't always have to be the same for everyone. Obviously it impacts people differently, but, um, is the conversation actually inclusive and equitable? So typically climate change has very much been communicated um, from kind of a top-down male white uh, perspective. Um, and this has been quite exclusionary for racialized people, indigenous people who um, are actually experts in understanding how to better um, work with the environment and sustainability matters. Um, and that connects also to we can't solve the climate crisis without gender equality. So as I mentioned, um, I've done writing on feminist planning and urbanism, so it's a big topic to me. Um, but and when we say feminism, sometimes that's perceived as kind of an extreme thing. Um, but we know that the climate crisis actually affects women. Um, greater, I think 80% of um, women after natural disasters are uh, displaced and also it's proven that uh, countries with lower carbon emissions um, actually have more women in positions of leadership. Um, but ultimately it's a wicked problem, it's complex, but we need to talk about it more. Um, I think there's a tendency because of the complexity um, that we don't have those conversations. Um, and my favorite, one of my favorite quotes from Dr. Ayanna Elizabeth Johnson, who co-edited a really great book called All You Can Save, is it's not about what you can do, it's about what we can do. Um, so she has this um, 
Venn diagram. So you can look at what are you good at? What is the work that needs doing and what brings you joy? So you can look at that from an inv individual perspective, your team at work um, or broader teams as well. So for me, um, what started from going to uh, a urban resilient summer school um, with this group of people on the screen um, has now evolved to a group of 130 plus people from all across the world. Um, so for me, that's what climate change communication means to me, but it's also improved um, my personal uh, professional work and volunteer work um, from how I understand and communicate about climate change. Thank you. Fantastic, thank you for sharing that, Jenna. Um, I'm just gonna pass over to Michael in just a second, but I just wanted to say to everybody um, that we will obviously be taking questions that come from the audience. So if anything pops up or anything was interesting in Jenna's talk that you want to um, bring up later on, feel free to pop it in the chat and we can come back to it later. Uh, I'm just gonna pass over to Michael now. Right. Hey, everyone. It's nice to be with you. It's great to see places dialing in from, I saw Vietnam and South Africa, Cape Town. So welcome, and we're thrilled to be with you. And I just want to footnote something Jenna said, talk about it, talk about it, talk about it. I was going to put a link in chat to Catherine Hayhoe's new book, Saving Us. She's one of my favorite climate communicators, and she's been doing the, the circuit, the talk show circuit of late and her main point is I mean she has many good points but her main point is talk about it talk about it talk about it so I just want to second what Jenna said about talking about it and also I put in chat a link to the book Jenna mentioned all we can save which is a great book highly recommend I have a few copies here that I've bought for friends too so let's let's jump in to my presentation and I want to mirror back, reflect back what you signed up for. This is what you signed up for. And so in our discussion, there are a lot of questions that Jenna and I have prepped for based on questions that came in early. But I just want to reflect that this is what you're expecting to learn during our time together, distill complex information about climate change without diluting the message, different tips and techniques for communicating climate change priorities to the public in a relatable way, how to engage the public and get their buy-in for climate policies. And hopefully Jenna and I will be able to cover all of this uh, within the hour. So is there one approach to climate communication? Of course not. Climate communication requires all of the above, many different approaches, and by stakeholders that have traditionally been left out of the conversation, to Jenna's point about white men kind of running the conversation so far up to this point and really making space for all the stakeholders who are bringing incredible knowledge and expertise. So I just want to second Jenna's point too about the equity needed and the justice needed in this space. But I want to start with this in terms of some consensus in the space about climate communication. Start with the values of the audience. What is the audience that you're speaking to care about? What do they value? Let's be creative. The traditional methods need to be <laughs> shaken up a bit. And show, don't tell is what I encourage our cities and the Carbon Neutral Cities Alliance to do. And I'm just going to wear this hat from, from now on for the rest of the presentation because it illustrates what I'm talking about a little bit here. So Burlington Electric Department is the biggest city in Vermont where I'm dialing in from. Burlington, their electric department handles their sustainability stuff and all their electrification work. And this is a hat that they gave me after I did some workshopping with them. And it's got camouflage, as you can tell, which if you think about Vermont and the values of Vermont, Vermont is a big hunting community, big outdoors community, big woods, forest activity, a lot of, a lot of timber here, timber products, et cetera. And so a lot of the people are out in the woods wearing camouflage. We're approaching hunting season now. And so what Burlington Electric Department did with their swag, with their merch, is they tapped into the values of the audience in Vermont and tried to, you know, bake in their messaging, but also do it in a way that was value based with the Vermont crowd. So I'm just, I'm wearing this as, as a tribute to Burlington's work here. All right, let's jump in. So I'm going to put these in chat later, but I, and, and Jenna has written for Apolitical too, but I just want to flag these articles, which I'll put into chat, which I won't really focus on today, but I want as resource for you going forward, if you find it helpful. And these are pieces that are available, click on them, check them out. And if you find them useful and want to follow up with me, please do. I'm happy to talk through any case studies in your cities or counties 
or national governments later, uh, but I'm not going to cover them here. What, what I do want to cover is some of the goals and objectives of the actual workshop. So distilling complex information, visuals, 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 and I'll give some examples from our cities so, so you see what I'm talking about. But given that we know visual communication is, is perhaps most effective in, in conveying meaning quickly, communicating meaning quickly, Let's move to visuals. Let's show, not tell. A lot of our cities still tend to, and I'm speaking from the city perspective because those are the clients I serve. Those are, that's my day job. Those are the people I work with most. Still a pretty heavy reliance on climate plans, like long PDFs, like 60, 80 page PDFs. And how do we move to visual communication? Because we know on social media, this is what's tracking. I see a future, Facebook sees a future where it's all video and visual and very little text. So we need to move our communication in that direction because that's how we convey quickly to a very short attention, attention deficit audience. London, I just wanna give this example because I love what London did here. They're one of our member cities in the Carbon Neutral Cities Alliance. And I love these visuals. They, they communicate quickly what's happening. It sounds like someone's audio, oh, there we go, great. Communicating quickly what's happening in London. For those who live in London know very well that air pollution is a real problem and it's killing thousands of people. And so how do we communicate visually the problem? And this is what London tackled and I loved what they did here with their idling campaign. Idling engine can produce this much pollution in one minute. So, so we're conveying quickly to the audience versus a big report or even an article that people may not read. This is a great visual that communicates quickly what's happening. I also want to encourage folks to check out climatevisuals.org, climatevisuals.org, spelled climatevisuals.org. This is what they're encouraging for principles in climate change communication. I'm not going to spend a lot of time here, but I just want you to have that resource if you don't know of it already. They have a lot of visuals you can use in terms of the causes of climate change, the solutions to climate change, etc. So they have a lot of visuals you can use, but this is all intuitive stuff. Show real people show it at scale, understand your audience, like we talked about at the beginning, tell stories. I'm helping our cities do more of that. And that's taking people outside their comfort zone because they might be the climate director or the environment director. And they're like, wait, I have to be a thought leader and a change agent too and tell my story. And so it's, it's exciting because cities are stepping out into new space to tell their stories. Emotional, powerful impacts and local so that people see what's happening locally. That's so important. So I encourage folks to check out this site and I'm just putting it here again so you have it You've got a host of visuals you can use. If you don't know where to go with your own visuals, go here, but I encourage you all to start collecting visuals of solutions in your backyard. And by backyard, I mean city, county, state, et cetera, as well as impacts and causes, because that'll be really helpful. Different tips and techniques for communicating climate to the public in a relatable way. Now, when we're talking about building electrification, which we have to do because buildings are a big carbon footprint, I could go into all of this. Hey, public, hey, audience, Look at all the details of this building, how we're gonna electrify it. Or I could just communicate to the audience in a way that they relate. Is it gonna be more comfortable? Check. Less maintenance? Check. Safer? More secure? Check. Cheaper? Less expensive? Check. So how do we communicate some of this work to an audience in ways that they care about? Remember their values, which are often economic, security, health, et cetera. It may not be climate, may not be the environment. So how do we communicate in ways that appeal to their basic human needs? This is something from New York State that I found useful and just, this is how we can appeal to most audiences based on what they care about. Embodied carbon, this is something our Carbon Neutral Cities Alliance cities in Europe, especially, but increasingly in North America are focusing on. I could take an audience through all these different steps and this visual is better than some because the audience could get this. They could understand each step of the embodied carbon space. Or how do I talk about a different building? A, a more enjoyable building to work in. So how do we communicate this stuff in ways that appeal to quality of life? And so thinking through creative ways, again, visuals are helpful here versus kind of tedious steps in an action plan that might be 60 pages long. Same with car-free cities. We could talk through congestion pricing, or we could just show people how life is better when we take cars off the street. Maybe we pilot this a little bit. We're only gonna do this for three months so the public doesn't protest too much. They start enjoying it, they love it, they don't wanna let go of it, and then we make it permanent because they love it so much. But really communicating how life is gonna be better when we do something like take cars off the street, which they might protest initially because people don't like their rights taken away from them, but we have to really show how life is better. 
Lastly, in terms of engaging the public and getting their buy-in for climate policy. So as I mentioned, Catherine Hayhoe, one of my favorite climate communicators, she's a doctor, she's a scientist, and she just came out with this book, Saving Us. What I love about what Catherine is doing here, and I think, and this was in her social, she is putting herself out there in really fun, vulnerable ways. I mean, this is a tight picture. Like how many of you have taken such a selfie and shared on social talking about climate? You can see Dr. Kim Cobb, uh, another great communicator in the climate space, interacting with her. And they're interacting in ways that most people interact on social media. So it does require all of us. I noticed at the beginning of the poll, am I a climate communicator? And 30% of you said no or unsure. And I hope that that 30% of you at the end of this call realize that yes, you are a climate communicator in all the ways. It may not be your official title, may not be your official job, but we are all climate communicators. And I want us to see even our social media, our day-to-day -day interaction with our neighbors as an opportunity for climate communication. And this is what Catherine's doing so well. But we all has, also have to communicate the, and this is from Helsinki, our work in ways that show again, how life is better. And this is Helsinki's great vacuum suction system that sucks all of it back into a centralized system. So your paper, your waste, your cartons, your glass, your food stuff, et cetera. It's so easy in this particular community in Helsinki, just to pop it in, life is better. It's easy to do what's right. It needs to be easy for people to on-ramp into the behavior change because behavior change can be difficult to think about. Also, we need to social norm it. This is out of, Sydney, uh, one of our members in the Carbon Neutral Cities Alliance, where they were very public about greening their buildings and the competition to do so, so that we could social norm the kind of green behaviors that we wanted to see. And this was successful in that regard. Another example from Helsinki, where they're gamifying it, they're creating an app that shows how easy it is to go green for your lifestyle, your consumption. So in thinking about consumption-based emissions and how we want people to change behavior, are we making it easy for them? And are we social norming it so that people are doing it? To the, to the white male point, another thing our cities are doing in terms of activating the public and engaging the public, if you Google citizen assembly, you will find... <laughs> I'm so sorry, this picture is so offensive, but it, it is the history of citizen council, citizen assemblies and city councils. And this is the picture that comes up. And I, I wanted to include it because we need to move away from this. And unfortunately, in some places in the world, including the US, the white men are still running the climate communi communication show, which, which obviously needs to change. But in thinking about engaging the public, our cities are increasingly moving towards co-creation model, co-production model, because the public wants to be involved. So how do we involve them in the co-production of our work? How do we crowdsource the incredible intelligence and expertise and experience in our communities? And what I just talked to our cities about, because we have our annual conference this week, was appreciative inquiry model, which the city of Cleveland used recently, to, to take the incredible expertise and experience in our communities, value it, lift it up, and let that drive the, the process in our cities or counties or communities or countries. So I encourage folks to check this out. I'm not gonna to talk today about appreciative inquiry, but I just wanna lift it up because some of our cities are using this and the city of Cleveland has definitely used this successfully to crowdsource ideas in the public and to engage them. City of Amsterdam is launching the citizen assembly shortly uh, in November, right? in and around COP26, and Glasgow is also launching a citizen assembly, again, to harness the incredible expertise and experience in the community. And this, this is what we need to do to enact behavior change in our community, to value their expertise and experience. It is tedious and time consuming, yes, but it does help lock in the kind of public engagement we want going forward and ultimately the behavior change and support for our climate policy going forward. That's it for me. I look forward to the questions. Over now. Fantastic. Thank you for that, Michael. There's a little, definitely a lot that we can take away from that. Um, as I mentioned before, feel free to pop any questions that you have in the chat. We did have some that were pre-submitted beforehand, so we're going to start off with some of them. But feel free to jump in at any point, pop your, um, pop your questions in the chat, and we will get to them later on in the session. I mean, that was a lot to dig into from, from both of your presentations there. Um, maybe something that we that, uh, we were talking about, and, and maybe I can, I can drop this to both of you as well. Um, I mean, we were talking a lot about um, underrepresentation of, of certain groups in the climate change space. How do we maybe engage with those groups? So be it women or maybe be it underrepresented groups just in, in government at any level. Um, and maybe Jenna, if I can start off with you, how do we really engage with those groups? 
Yeah, I mean, bluntly, I will say try harder. <laughs> um, I think, um, especially coming from Canada, um, the the tendency is to like assume how certain groups want to be engaged versus when you're having conversations with um, Indigenous people, um, they should be approached and asked how they want to be engaged with so that you can construct the engagement and the conversation around kind of what works for them versus assuming. Um, and then I would also say if you're trying to engage underrepresented populations, um, stereotypically coming from like a planner who has worked in the public sector, um, there's like evening engagement events that are very much not accessible if you have kids, um, if you work multiple jobs. So thinking about whether not necessarily always doing the online event, although obviously that's the go-to for the pandemic, um, but kind of making those engagement opportunities sort of more accessible. So whether that means going to people, um, even if it's something like door knocking or having those kind of more coffee table conversations. Um, yeah, but just sort of trying a bit harder to engage those people. Um, I think I've heard a lot in my professional career that, um, oh, well, we, we just didn't hear anything from those groups of people. And I think that means that you're not actually communicating the message properly. Um, and that connects to what Michael was saying, that if you don't actually explain to people how something impacts them, then they're not going to engage. Um, yeah, so that's my thoughts. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. I, I mean, something that I've definitely heard is uh, don't bring people to the table, bring the table to them is definitely the way that you engage those underrepresented groups. Um, Michael, can I come across to you at the same question if you've got any thoughts on that one? Yeah, the, the models definitely exist and the communication is happening. So to Jenna's point, like, oh, we didn't hear from group X, Y, or Z. Well, they're definitely communicating. So it's up to us to find out where they're communicating, how they're communicating. Are we the right messengers? Who is the right messenger? But to, to find the models and the mechanisms by which these groups are communicating and making sure that we're lifting them up and prioritizing them would be my only add. Okay, great. And um, we've actually had a couple of uh, questions in the chat. Um, so we can see one. So um, this one is a, is a little bit, it's definitely something that's um, been very popular in the UK at the moment, but we're seeing a lot of um, climate protests going on, especially by Extinction Rebellion um, in the UK, especially it was a couple of years ago, but there's been a lot more kind of frequent ones. Um, how effective do you think those, those maybe are at bringing climate change to maybe the forefront of people's communications? Um, I know it's a little bit of a strange question, but um, yeah, I can pass it over to maybe Michael first. Yeah, I'll just quickly say, I think all approaches are needed provided we're not doing violence in the protesting, which uh, I'm not implying that there is violence being done, but I do think all approaches are needed and it's finding the approach that you're most comfortable in, but protest is an important part of raising awareness. And so, I'll, yeah, I'll just leave it at that. Great, fantastic. Um, so, I mean, we've got a couple of really great questions coming through now, but I'm just gonna pop onto one that was um, kind of submitted beforehand. Um, I mean, this is something that definitely both of you have spoken about, um, about kind of distilling these really complex messages down into something that, that people are able to um, understand in, in kind of terms that are familiar to them. Um, Jenna, maybe if I come across to you, do you have any kind of top tips that we can, that you've maybe seen about um, ways you kind of can distill these really big messages down to more of a local audience? Yeah, I'm not sure about top tips um, necessarily, <laughs> um, but yeah, I would say um, understand who your local audience is, but then also understand that um, you can't just think of like a singular community in terms of like a geographical space, because if you're talking about carbon emissions, um, obviously it has regional and broader impacts than just thinking of like, I'm engaging with this community and they're the only ones that interact with this space. Um, sorry, that's a little plannery for you. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think, again, kind of going back to what Michael said and his wise words, um, a lot of it, I think, is visuals. Um, and also, I think, connecting to one of the other questions is that kind of plain language. Um, because climate change has been communicated very top down, but it's also been communicated. I think it's improving, um, like the IP. CC report um, now has kind of summaries and I think way more kind of relatable and digestible information versus just kind of 
scientific huge paragraphs um but yeah just communicating in ways that people can understand and how they kind of see the narrative that impacts their every day yeah i think we always get told remove the jargon because people just can't relate to it so that's definitely useful uh, i mean michael you spoke about this extensively in, in your presentation about kind of using visuals um, and, and a question we've got in the chat is really, um, how do you retain the most important part of a report um, when you're trying to share a visual? So um, how do you kind of keep it simple, but also maintain that that kind of level of um, the, all that important information that you're looking to, to get? Yeah, so what our cities will often do and organizations will often do, they'll have an infographic that is overwhelming the audience with info graphics. And, and so what I'll encourage cities to do is just chop it up, serve up one concept to your public a week or a month or whatever you want to space it out to uh, every other day. And so the infographic is a simple singular concept that you're trying to convey. It's just one idea versus I'll see infographics with you know, 10, 12, 15 concepts. It's just too busy. And we, we need to get past our joy of design. WRI, World Resources Institute, whom I love for a variety of reasons, does this very well where, and I'm, I'm being a little sarcastic and much love to the WRI crew who might even be on this call. They have data visuals that are impressive for climate geeks and data geeks, but for the public, not as digestible. And so we need to move away from the graphic designing that is fun to look at because we just took a whole bunch of data and made a really complex infographic, but isn't digestible for the public. So it's really being mindful of the audience and being singular. If you've got an infographic concept, being singular about it. Uh, if, I, if I may also tailor, and I just wanna be mindful of some of the questions coming into chat that has to do with prompting effective action and engaging st stakeholders. And I want to give one story out of Vermont where I am living on a farm in a rural part of Vermont. And when I think about my neighbors who have engaged in traditional climate action, but they wouldn't call it that, it's because life forced them to do so. And so their on-ramp to behavior change was because life was better in the climate action lane, and I'll, and I'll say what I mean by that. So I have 52 solar panels, I have heat pumps, I have power wall batteries, and I have electricity when storms kill the power, or kill the grid here. And so people will drive by my place and I will have the lights on, I won't have a generator because I got my batteries and I've got the solar to back it up when the sky is clear. And people have stopped by my house and asked, why do you, how do you have power? And people have come to my place to take showers and to get warmth. And that's my opportunity to talk to them and be like, well, if you talk to our utility, you too could get this deal with solar and power wall batteries. And there's a lot of incentives right now. And I never talk about climate change. And they, they engage that, even though they're not from the traditional camp that would, and I don't want to stereotype, but like they probably voted for our, our previous president as an example. And they wouldn't talk climate change with me, but they're changing behavior because life is better. And so I recognize we're having to let go of some of our proclivity to talk about data and science and get people on board the science, which is what I think the community in the US did for so long, versus let's let's get behavior changed ASAP because life is better, but we have to show, not tell, and give them opportunities to do so that are affordable, which it isn't for everyone currently. And so those of us who can need to, to do it to lower the prices for others. So there is some showing, not telling. And then for the climate communicators out there, I want everyone to be telling their personal story more. And this has forced me out of my comfort zone in the last year too, last couple of years actually, in telling my personal story because I used to be very guarded about revealing my personal life. Well, that's, that's changed for a whole bunch of reasons, but it does require all of us to do it. And how I would love to see Al Gore, for example, and Catherine Hayhoe and others are doing more of this kind of personal storytelling about how they've changed their lives, how they've changed their behaviors. And I would love for all of us to do more of this. You know, like if Al Gore would walk you through why he went vegan or when he's up there giving his talk, I would love for him to like look at his suit that he's wearing and realize, I'm guessing, I actually don't know. So I want to be careful about judging, prejudging here, but I'm guessing the suit is, is part of fast fashion. I haven't heard him talk about sustainable fashion and slow fashion, uh, but I'm guessing the suits he's wearing, a lot of us wear. I've changed my suits over the last couple of years, but how do we be very public and very personal about our own behavior change 
so that we are leading by example, that we're really using our personal stories in all the ways, whether it's the food we're eating, the clothes we're wearing, the cars we're driving or not driving, and the difficulties in it. Let's be very public about our stories because it will be helpful in telling our process for the publics that we're trying to convince to. And I think we need to go above and beyond what we've been accustomed to in our roles as communicators and really be, really be personal about the challenges and opportunities here. Yeah, that's really fantastic to hear. And I think it's it's a it's a common issue we see when we're when kind of communicating around climate change is people almost treat climate change as if it was uh, like a dirty word or a dirty phrase. They don't don't want to say it. And sometimes when you communicate without using the word climate change about climate change, you're more likely to get people to engage with it. Um, which is a very massive subject. So maybe actually I might come to um to you, Jenna, with this next question. How do you have conversations with people? Um, who might be climate deniers, uh, and, and how do you tackle that that barrier? Oh boy! <laughs> Sorry, that's um, not Very easily. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't, I haven't had direct conversations like in public engagement events back in the days when we had those in person with people that directly said that, but I've definitely. Um, it's kind of been assumed by what they were conveying. And I think it goes back to um, kind of connecting to their narrative, like, like what Michael was saying. Um, even if you, you don't even mention climate change, but you just ask them kind of questions about themselves. So like, what do they do professionally or where do they live? And then you can connect climate change impacts to um, how it might affect them on a daily basis. So like, do you, do you live in a warm climate? Um, do you need air conditioning to function or like, do you have a garden? Um, do you need to, to like walk somewhere every day and are realizing that it's getting hotter so you need shading? So things like that, I think there's definitely a way they might still be a denier after you explain to them <laughs> the impacts um, that it's gonna have on them. Um, but I think it's just about kind of selective um, data um, and having those kind of specific um, conversations versus saying like, oh, we need to make these like grand bioengineering climate change choices and them not understanding how that affects them individually. Okay, um, Michael, can I come across to you with the same question? Yeah, so Catherine Hayhoe talks about this too. And if anyone globally is interested in some of the polling that the Yale uh, Project on Climate Change Communication, Anthony Lizerowitz runs that there. And then Ed Mayback runs or used to run the I think he's still the director at George Mason University's Center for Climate Change Communication. George Mason and Yale have, over the years, created a lot of good polling data around what moves people. And they talked about the six, six Americas and six types of people in the United States. And dismissives are one of those. You could categorize that as deniers, too. And so for those of you interested in some of that, uh, especially in the US context, I encourage you to check out Yale and, and Mason's centers for climate change communication. What, what they talk about and what Catherine Hayhoe talks about in her book, Saving Us, is that the dismissives aren't as worth your engagement as those in the middle. And so we can do a better job, though I certainly second Jenna's point about appealing to uh, what might resonate with them. And I've had conversations in Vermont with dismissives and found traction on certain uh, energy security, uh, decentralized grids, um, energy independence concepts that appeal to libertarians in the United States. So there is opportunity there, but rather that because the dismissives or the deniers are actually a small chunk of society, generally speaking. And so there's a lot of work we can do with the moderate middle that hasn't engaged, but needs to. So that we really swing the pendulum. So I generally spend less time with the small percentage of you know, less than 10% of the dismissives. And I try to spend more time with the moderate middle that, and even the enviros who I need to do more. I want the enviros to do more in terms of changing their diets and their fashion, et cetera. So that's, that's what I would say on the dismissives front. Okay, um, we've had a couple of questions coming in on, on, on a subject maybe around kind of showing people what long-term change looks like. So, so how do you, and Jenna, I'm going to come to you with this one if that's okay. Um, how do we engage people when maybe they're not going to see the results immediately or quickly? How do we keep them engaged with making these changes um, 
to kind to kind of towards a better future when they maybe aren't going to see the next changes within within a decade or or even a few decades time. Um, how do we communicate that with them that it's that it is a benefit for the long term? Yeah, um, I mean, it makes me think about the the systems exercise that we did in Copenhagen and thinking about sort of the most desirable future. Um, so again, kind of connecting people like how do you want um, your family or your kids or the future to look like um, and even if you might not see that in like a tangible sort of short-term way um, how can we get there so I think there's we may not see the impacts in the sense that you refer to kind of immediately. And we know given our attention spans and social media and everything these days, like we have to see the results right away. Um, but I think kind of understanding um, what could happen on more of a short-term level if we don't do something, um, but then also engaging with the positivity about this is how we can improve in the future. Um, yeah, hopefully that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, no, definitely. Um, and just a little bit of a kind of follow up to that one as well. I'm sorry, I'm going to stick with you again, Jenna. Um, I mean, I guess, how do we engage maybe within our own within government kind of how do we get maybe politicians to think about it when, when we know that they kind of have maybe short lived um, policies that they're going to be pushing in their electoral terms? How do we push them to also put it in their agendas as well? Yeah, I think that's a good question. Um, so for my current role at the city of Victoria, we've actually um, connected with a program through the University of British Columbia called Transforming Cities from Within. Um, so we've kind of created this, this question um, that is how can we integrate um, climate and equity considerations um, internally um, to, the, to the city in operations. So we're basically creating like a community of practice um, because there's a tendency for all these different departments to be like, okay, equity, okay, climate, but then we don't communicate with each other because we're trying to meet kind of deadlines. Um, and the important thing about this project and this initiative is that we've had buy-in from council. Um, so it's not one of those things where we'll kind of come up with this, this project plan or the community practice and then go to council to talk about it. And they'll be like, well, we don't really see what the benefit is. Um, I think a lot of the time, yeah, as you said, it's difficult with leadership and council turnover where the message is not really there. But I think that's also an aspect of kind of having those annual report backs and the metrics where you're saying kind of this is what your predecessor or you told us um, versus kind of being like, where did this notice of motion come from? Why are you talking to us about this? Um, yeah, so having having the buying from leadership and being able to connect back and saying sort of this is what you told us and making the business case um, for how it will improve things organizationally. Okay, great. Um, and Michael, I'm going to come to you with a little bit of a different question here. So, um, I mean, a lot of communications we see around climate change can be quite harsh and quite dramatic, but as they probably need to be. Um, but how do we kind of balance those real kind of harsh predictions um, with kind of encouraging people to make those positive actions? How do we how do we put a positive spin on something that is extremely kind of harsh and, and needs to be maybe sometimes? Yeah, yeah. Hope is hope is needed now more than ever before. And Catherine Hayhoe talks about that in her book, especially given the paralysis of the overwhelm that is induced from both the climate crisis but also the pandemic too. So, giving people local solutions is the easiest. Uh, I hear you in terms of the chat, short term versus long term. This is why short term visible solutions and action is so essential on so many fronts. I am not a fan of 2030, 2040, 2050 goal setting. I am not a fan of President Biden saying existential threat all the time. These are terms that are distant. They're not now. People are thinking one year ahead, one month ahead, six months ahead. So how do we be short term in everything we're doing in terms of showing action solutions people can take and how life is going to be 
be better here and now. And it's possible. It's a little more work. And yes, you know, behind the scenes, we, we need to be planning clearly for long term too, because some of the big systems change require some long term investments. So I understand that very much, but it is going to require a, a localism and a short termism that is going to change some of our messaging because we have been as planners planning for 2030, 2040, and 2050. But again, people, people aren't caring about that as much. We do know that extreme weather motivates people more than climate change. And that's in the United States, that's bipartisan because Republicans will plan in policy. And when I was in Congress, I was working with some Republicans who were helping the government prepare for extreme weather. We do know that extreme weather has its place in terms of motivating action and policy. And at least in the United States, in a bipartisan way, I'm guessing there's some universality here. So we do need to use the opportunity of extreme weather to pivot into action, proactive action, to help communities become more resilient. And, and I say resilient because in Vermont, we had a hurricane, Irene, that devastated the state. And so the state understands Vermont strong, resilience, that is bipartisan, that is universal in terms of its appeal here. And so finding the right language is important, um, but let's not skirt from the fear, but let's use the fear to motivate. And what I found in climate films, for example, is that they'll spend three quarters of the film impressing you as to how daunting the reality is, like climate crisis, <laughs> climate crisis coming is going to be chaotic. And so the first three quarters of the film are awful. And then the last quarter of the film, it's like, oh, but you can make a difference. Hope is, and then the music changes and the soundtrack changes and like, hope is on the way we can make a difference. And that's not a successful model because three quarters into the film, we're now emotionally paralyzed and can't move. And then they're trying to resuscitate us at the end and it's too late. So it's baking in early action, opportunity, hope, optimism, real things people can do in their real lives right now. So it's pivoting off the fear. I do think, I do, I do think the reality of extreme weather has its place, but it's not lingering there in the overwhelm and it's pivoting quickly to action. I'm just going to jump to to probably a, a completely different subject matter here, but actually this is something that we're seeing in the chat and I just want to make sure it, it kind of has its time today. Um, and Michael, I think I'm going to come to you for this one, but um, it's a little bit about talking about how developed countries um, need to be providing more kind of climate finance um, to the less developed countries who maybe um, are kind of contributing more in global emissions. Um, so like what what we can be doing in developed countries to help it as it because this is a global issue we can't be looking at this in silos we need to be looking at this on a global scale um so yeah, yeah. What, what can we be doing yeah it's outrageous that we have not the rich countries have not ponied up the 100 billion in the past a year needed on a climate finance front it is it is immoral and i'm not a moral messenger generally speaking uh what what i put in the chat is something congresswoman clark and i have added to the conversation because it predates us around climate reparations. But in thinking about new narratives, climate refugees, climate migrants, climate displacement that comes from you know, a lot of this climate impact that came from our emissions in the rich world and now less developed countries in the great climate injustice that we're seeing is impacting them in a, in a very devastating way. I, I do think we need to think of new ways to talk about this that might resonate because the old climate finance models just they didn't have traction and they're stalled for the most part in G7, G20, UN conversations. And so finding new ways, to, again, to lift up stories. I could see a lot more storytelling in the climate refugee, climate displacement space. And that's something I wanna to contribute to as a storyteller. How do we lift up these devastating stories? We tend to do it in the media well when it comes to war refugees, like classic war refugees. And I'm, and I'm sorry to put it in quotes, but if we think about Syria, which was climate displacement related, but Afghanistan certainly, the media tend to do a good job of capturing the, the refugee story when it comes to fleeing from violence. Of course, that violence might be climate related, but how can we as storytellers for cities or counties or countries on this call that are receiving displaced populations from climate disasters, how can you lift up their stories too so that the stories can, can hopefully compel action? Um, so clim again, climate finance conversation has been just needs a complete revamp in terms of language being used. And I think stories lifting up of, of some of these movements already happening, climate migrant movements already happening, can be helpful, won't be the fix, but can be helpful here. 
Okay. And Jenna, I'm just going to come across to you with a different question now that we've had um, kind of through the chat. And we obviously understand as a, as a generation, actually, the youth that are coming through today definitely seem to be more engaged with this as a message. I think they understand that it's going to be them that is affected by this. Um, but maybe how do we communicate with them about, about what they can do um, when they maybe feel kind of maybe... Um, angry at the messages um, that are coming across and, and maybe what the older generation are doing that, that are going to affect them. How can we communicate with them and make sure that they are doing as much as they possibly can? Yeah, um, it's a good question. I mean, I, I listened to Greta's speech also, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> um, it was a great one as per usual. Um, and I think for me, I kind of connect it back to urban planning and kind of that city building discourse where if you're designing cities to be more equitable, um, if you think about how children or youth participate them, in them, um, then they're actually built to be better for everyone. Um, so engaging with youth has been kind of a new, a newer thing in urban planning, which seems ridiculous to say, why did we not engage with youth before? And I think that connects also to the climate conversation, um, where again, like don't, don't assume, you know, how youth want to be engaged or want to be involved. Um, and I think that needs to be kind of integrated into, um, any climate conversation, um, because ultimately um, these are the people that are going to live with um, all the kind of mistakes or positive things um, that we're doing. Um, so I think, yeah, just having that conversation with kind of similar to what I was saying about engaging with certain different communities, um, asking them um, how they want to be engaged, how they want to be involved and how they feel excluded um, from these processes, because not only is the COP26 and these climate conversations very male dominated, it's also very focused on kind of certain groups of people, right? Which is very exclusionary, not only for um, women, but for youth, for various other different groups. So yeah, I think youth, but then how do we, if we make the conversation more open to youth and ideally it'll become kind of more of a feminist approach um, and be more inclusive for everyone. Yeah, definitely agree. Uh, Michael, have you got anything that you wanted to add to that as well? Uh, Jenna, Jenna captured it all. Yeah, completely agree. Okay, fantastic. Um, so we are actually coming to, to the end of our session here today. Um, so I'm just going to start wrapping up. So I want to just say thank you to everybody that has joined us. Um, we have a little tradition here at Apolitical where we ask everybody for their one word takeaways from the session. Um, so if everyone can just start popping them in the chat, but actually I'm going to come to my speakers for kind of for their one word takeaways first while other people are popping theirs in the chat. Um, so Jenna, if I can come to you first, what's your kind of one word takeaway from, from the last hour? Um, I'm going to steal from Greta here and say uh, justice. <laughs> I was going to go with optimism, but but yeah, I'm going to say justice. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, Michael, can I come to you as well? Oh, so many words. Um, more. Well, I look forward to more conversation with everyone. So I hope we continue this. But storytelling, just storytelling, 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 storytelling. Okay, fantastic. And I'm seeing a lot coming into the chat now. Um, definitely visuals. Uh, that definitely seems to be an important one, but also inspiration and, and motivating and, and keeping things simple as well. It seems to be the theme of today is go with simplicity. Um, definitely seeing people echo you as well. Um, Michael, there's some storytelling coming into the chat as well. Okay, fantastic. Well, it has been great to have you all on the call today. And um, thank you to both Jenna and Michael for sharing their expertise and sharing their time with me um, today. I hope everybody enjoyed it. Uh, as we wrap up, I just wanted to add that for everybody that registered for this event, um, you will receive an email with uh, the recording from today's event, along with a whole list of, of resources that we can share with you um, coming from today's presentation. Um, and there's also a couple of extra other opportunities for you to learn with Apolitical as well. So we've got a couple of other courses coming up, uh, such as inclusivity uh, in the public service and how to prepare for the future of policymaking. And we'll send some more information through on those ones 
in the follow-up email. Um, but if you like today's event and want to do something similar, you can also create a workshop or a bootcamp with us. So we will add in some links again into the email about maybe how you can collaborate with us. Um, and I believe my, my colleague Vipasha is just going to pop it into the chat now. So if you feel like you want to create a workshop with us, we are more than happy to help. So yeah, the link is in the chat. Um, but yeah, you can also, final final push, uh, you can also contribute as both Jenna and Michael have done. If you want to write an article for us at Apolitical, again, we will pop the link in the chat and we would be more than happy for you to share your expertise and maybe what you're doing to help further this issue or, or other issues within the public sector. Um, sharing your contributions with other apolitical users is how we hope to hope to create change. Yeah, and as Michael said, it's storytelling, but just through apolitical. And um, thank you all for joining us today. And I hope you enjoyed today's session. Uh, I'm going to leave you all now. And I hope you enjoy either the rest of your morning or the rest of your afternoons. Um, and thank you all. <laughs>